So we're taking the third installment of co of a common destiny or not. Um, co of a common destiny or not. We started three Tuesdays ago and um, we had an extended session last Tuesday. So if you're joining us, those of you joining us online and on site, if it's your first time here, what we're doing today is a continuation of something that we began uh, three Tuesdays ago. Of course, generally, this is the 37th episode of, in the series of male and female that we began several months ago. We took a break and now we are back. Uh, so it's the 37th episode of, doc, of uh, male and female, but we are treating particularly the subject matter of co heirs of a common destiny or not. And the idea basically is to say when a man and a woman, when they get married, what happens to their purpose, what happens to their calling or their callings, that the calling the sense of purpose that each of them had before they got married, what happens to it? Are they supposed to, everybody face whatever it is you felt God wanted you to do before we got married and hopefully we'll find, we'll meet somewhere or does somebody forego their understanding of purpose for the other person's sake or do you merge it together so you have 200% uh, in the end, 100% from the man, 100% from the woman, and then selectively see what each person can do. We, in order to consider that, we had to look at the more fundamental issue of oneness in marriage. And we did say that. Why oneness is anticipated in every sphere uh, relatively speaking, every sphere, as it were, to say um, spiritually and otherwise, um, that oneness in scripture is anticipated, but what is immediately mentioned and given many times is a oneness that has to do with the flesh. And the Bible distinguishes that oneness from the oneness with the Lord Jesus and says that he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. It doesn't just say he that is joined to the Lord is one with the Lord. It designates the area, the specific aspect or category of our constitution where that oneness is achieved. In the same way, if you join with another person, from Genesis to Matthew to 1 Corinthians, the language of scripture is the two shall become one flesh. It doesn't just say the two shall become one, but that they shall become one flesh. So we said that when the oneness of flesh in that context is experienced, there are other areas of oneness that are supposed to be pursued and are supposed to be actualized. Uh, so somebody mentioned something interesting to me this afternoon to say, okay, if, if it's this kind of thing, then probably, then where is the place of God's will? It means I can just marry anybody and we can pursue oneness. Well, I'm not dealing with God's will at this moment. I'm just simply saying that. Um, when a man and a woman get married, it is not automatic that they are going to become one in every sphere of their lives. That is already presupposing that they are getting married was the right thing to do. I'm just simply saying that when you get married, I'm not looking at how did you get married, I'm saying all things being equal, uh, that oneness is something that does not happen automatically in every other sphere or is not a moment like the oneness of the flesh. You'd realize that God's will, and I think I've mentioned this in the course of this series at some point, that God's will is necessary if you are going to have a good marriage. But God's will is not sufficient. All right? God's will is necessary but it is not sufficient. 
and I can throw up instances out of scripture for you to just justify that point that the will of God is absolutely necessary if you are going to have a marriage that fulfills destiny, a good marriage according to the definition of heaven. Because if you are married outside of God's will, you know, then you are already outside of God's will in that sense, as far as your choice is concerned. My point, however, is to say, and it's a very curious thing, because uh, the choice of who to marry may be the wrong choice, but your marriage will be validated by God. I've already taught you that before now. Isn't it? Yes. yes. God will validate it. If he couldn't stop you and you got married. Hmm? We say, okay. We'll collect the marriage as given. The one you've given us now, we have collected it. If you wake up tomorrow and say, I made a mistake. God said, no, no. We are not complaining. We, we have collected this one. All right. You need to get that into your spirit. It's so serious that the Bible says when two people get married as unbelievers and one of them becomes a believer, the believing spouse does not even have the right to abscond, to, call, to quit, or to ask for a divorce on the basis of the fact that when we entered into this thing, if I know what I know now, I will not have married you. Because that time I was an unbeliever. So now I want to go and find the will of God for my life in Christ Jesus. The Bible says, don't live. Hmm? How much less when you got married as a Christian? To now say, I miss God's will. Hmm? But I am now sure that uh, I can meet God's will now, even though I missed it before. That opportunity is not there. This, what I've said now cannot be the basis of a legitimate separation or divorce. So, however, I'm saying that the will of God is still a thing. And the will of God is necessary Yet, it is not sufficient. Hallelujah. I give you instances of two marriages from the Old Testament. And then I face my... I will not be preaching for long this evening. Even if it rains. Now, the... Yeah, so in case you are a rainmaker, you want to call the rain. Even if it rains, I won't be preaching for long. Um, so I was trying to say that. The first marriage that we know of, the first marriage in history, is a marriage between the first man and the first woman in history. That's the marriage of Adam and Eve. The marriage of Adam and Eve did hit a rock at some point. The reason for that thing you saw going on, Ma, Adam, where are you? Say, I heard your voice and we're naked, went to hide ourselves. Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree that I said you should not eat? Adam said, not so fast, not so fast. It's not, this thing is not my fault. The woman that you gave to be with me. You see, when I was alone, I didn't have any issues with you. It was when you brought this woman into my life that we are having issues. And these issues we are having, the woman is a cause. Hello? The woman that you gave to be with me Adam did not even say my wife. He said the woman that you gave to be with me was the one that gave me this thing. It was that woman you gave me that gave me the thing I had. And you would have imagined that. Why, why is this happening? Why are they having this? So God now said, okay, Eve, what happened? Eve said, it was a serpent that gave me. Serpent. Serpent. There was no... Serpent couldn't say the devil made me do it. <laughs> but you saw, you saw the man passing blame onto the wife and not even coming out 
to call the wife the wife on that day. They wouldn't stand together. They would not uh, uh, make a... So the man and his wife are now doing this game. But my point is this. If anybody could have married wrongly, Adam, Adam and Eve were not candidates for wrong marriages. Even if Adam didn't want the will of God. Huh? It would not have been possible to marry and not marry the will of God. That's for Adam. We speak uh, metaphorically, spiritually, symbolically, when we talk about bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. For Adam, it was literal. Literal. You, you could not be more convinced, confident, and assured of your choice in marriage than Adam could have been. Nobody can have as much confidence, no matter how, no matter everything that happened when you got married, however well you thought it was the will of God. Satan can still tell you, what if? There's still a room for Satan to tell you, what if? That room did not exist with Adam. Adam's wife was Adam's wife. It, it was the absolutely perfect, ultimate will of God. Now, many of you have different qualifiers for the will of God. The highest qualification you have for God's will in your vocabulary, Adam met it in having Eve as his wife. Yet, we saw them playing cat and mouse on this day when things blew up in their faces. I'm saying to you that the will of God is necessary, but the will of God is not sufficient. You need the will of God plus more. All right? Second marriage, very quickly. Isaac and Rebecca. We'll be looking at them in a more positive light this evening. Isaac and Rebecca. Their marriage is one of the most beautiful uh, Old Testament type that you can immediately see its fulfillment in the New Testament in our relationship with Jesus and all of that. Uh, the bride of Christ and the Holy Spirit that helps to unite the bride with the groom and all of that. And then the father in the picture. It's such a terrific terrific type. The marriage of uh, Rebecca to uh, Isaac was so divinely orchestrated, if you read the story in Genesis 24, that you would know that this is the wife of Isaac. God led Eleazar of Damascus, who I believe uh, the, the prophet in charge of, uh, the servant in charge of Abraham's estate as Abraham's estate, uh, servant went out to look for a wife. And the way the Lord ordered his step all the way to Abraham's people so that the wife was sought for Isaac. And as we'll see later on, a lot of things happened that tell you very clearly that Isaac and Rebekah were made one for the other. Hallelujah. But even though we can almost beat our chest with, you know, 99% assurance or 100% in hindsight to say this was surely God's will for Isaac, the marriage was not a very enviable one. There were all kinds of things that didn't go right in that marriage. Where was I teaching this? Maybe it was Abuja. Yeah, it was an Abuja word count. The last Abuja word count, I, rem I guess. I don't know what I was talking about, that I was talking about Isaac and Rebecca. So they, are, they marry, and then Rebecca was barren. Isaac goes to entreat the Lord for Rebecca. Right? Oh, yeah, we're looking at things to come. Okay? Yes, we're looking at things to come. Isaac now goes to entreat the Lord on behalf of Rebecca. 
we are not told that Rebecca was part of that prayer meeting. Then, Rebecca becomes pregnant because God was entreated of Isaac, her husband. So God heard his prayer and decided to answer his prayer. In answer to the prayer of Isaac, Rebecca became pregnant. And when Rebecca became pregnant, she realized that her pregnancy was not progressing normally. Even though she had never been pregnant before, she was not the first human being being pregnant. So she asked other women, say, is this how it used to happen when you are pregnant? They say, no, this is not normal. So Rebecca decided to go and ask the Lord that, why am I having this kind of unusual experience with this pregnancy? Again, the Bible says Rebecca went to inquire of the Lord. We are not aware. The Bible doesn't say anything about Isaac joining Rebecca in this inquiry. But that's not even the point, at least. Rebecca goes and inquires of the Lord, like, God, what is going on? And the Bible said, the Lord said unto her that two manner of people are in thy womb. Two nations shall be separated from thy bowel. The one shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. All right? This was what the Lord said to Rebecca. This was not what the Lord said to Rebecca and Isaac. So, when Rebecca comes back from this inquiry that she made of the Lord, we are now told at the end of that chapter that Isaac loved Esau. Eventually, she gives birth. So, you can imagine what Rebecca is looking out for. Like, which one is the older, which one is the younger? And if you are going to choose, you know the one that is going to carry the heritage and the destiny and the covenant over the family into the next generation. It is the younger one. So, before the two children were born, the choice of who to prefer had already been made for Rebecca by that information that came to her from the Lord. Okay? But Isaac was not in the picture. Because Isaac was not there when the Lord told Rebecca what was going on within her. And there is nothing in scripture that indicates that Rebecca at any point informed the husband to say, look at what the Lord has said to me. Because I was having this discomfort and I went to inquire or I've been praying and now this is what the Lord has said to me. We almost can say that Rebecca did not tell Isaac. Because if, he, if she had, Isaac would not have been doing what he did when he was trying to bless Esau. Remember? Isaac did the normal thing that she, he should do if you have two sons. The older one is supposed to take the heritage, the blessing. There's the blessing of the firstborn. And that was exactly what Isaac was going to do, which would have been okay if the Lord had not spoken otherwise. Except that, even though the Lord had spoken otherwise, Isaac was not in the picture. Because the person who was in the picture was Rebecca, and Rebecca did not break the news to her husband Isaac. So, now Rebecca is on the high horse of having divinely revealed information that her husband does not know. And there are ladies like that. All right? Very spiritual, you know. They used to have conversation every other night with Amos, with Nahum, with Jonah. All right? Micaiah. Uh -huh. Those prophets of the Old Testament that they don't used to read their books. You have not read Nahum, but in your vision, is Nahum that used to come and inform you the alignment of 2023 election and all of that. Now, so you have those, those, those women that have these very, very, very deep spiritual experiences. Hmm? So, when they, when they see their husband watching TV or reading newspaper, they say, look at this canal man now. <laughs> eh? When, when people are interfacing with Nahum, <laughs> this one is a uh, newspaper. So somewhere in her heart, she even begins to disdain her husband. 
because she has not learned the lesson of milk cow. All right? She begins to disdain her husband in her heart. Uh, Isaac was not aware of what God had said concerning the boys because Isaac was not there when the Lord spoke to Rebekah. When Rebekah came out of that place, Rebekah decided to take upon herself the responsibility of fulfilling the thing that God has said. When the father of the boys wanted to do, nat to do the natural thing, which would have been to call the older son and say, okay, I want to give you the blessing. The woman had become a monitoring spirit because she has received information from the Lord that her husband does not know. So she had been watching, she, you know, her CCTV camera, everything was set in place to ensure that the husband doesn't do anything. And then, at this time, the husband is kind of old. The eyes were dim. He could not really see. But Rebecca was still more agile, active. And, all right? So Isaac say, says to Esau, get venison, go to hunt, get some game, and make the meal for me the way I like it. The Bible had already told us that Isaac loved Esau because of the venison. And the Bible said, but Rebekah loved Jacob. They didn't say because. <laughs> the Bible just simply said, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Isaac loved Esau because of the venison. But Rebekah loved Jacob. All right, it's on the screen. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison. Genesis 25, 28. But Rebekah loved Esau. Full stop. At this point, it is let the reader understand. Hmm? Rebekah loved. Rebekah loved Jacob. Isaac loved Esau. Because. He did eat of his venison. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Rebekah's love for Jacob was informed by Rema, by revelation. Hmm? So this man, oh. when will he learn that we walk not by sight, but by faith? Meanwhile, meanwhile, Rebekah had forgotten that she would not be pregnant without the intercessory prayers of the husband Isaac. It was Isaac that went to entreat the Lord for his wife, who was barren. Because the Bible told us where the problem was. You know, when there is no child in a home, the problem can be the man's, and it can be the woman's, or it could be both. In their case, the Bible did say that it was Rebekah that was barren. But it was Isaac. Isaac. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. It was Isaac's prayer labors that led to the turnaround in the barren situation of Rebekah. Now that Rebekah is pregnant, one revelation that God has given her has entered her head. She has become the superior spouse because she has secret info from the spirit that the husband has not been able to break through portals and apertures to be able to acclimatize himself with the realms of the speakings of the decrees of the watchers and the holy ones. So, it, she's now... She's now woman of God. And she's doing woman of God for her husband. Woman of God. I want you to know that. All right. Let's leave it for now. So, when, when, um, Rebecca kept watching and watching and watching and realized that the husband was not going to do the natural thing to do. 
which was to give the blessing of the firstborn to the firstborn. She decided to orchestrate situations to realize the actualization of the revelation that God gave to her when God said, the one shall be stronger than the other and the older shall serve the younger. This whole thing would have been very easy if she had come back and called her husband and said, ah, look at, look at, look at, look at what the Lord has said. Okay? Isaac would not have hesitated to place that blessing upon Jacob. Isaac was a man of covenant. Isaac was a man of God. Eventually, the blessing with which Jacob left home was not the one that he stole from his father. You remember? Isaac intentionally called Jacob and now blessed Jacob and now sent Jacob to the house of Laban to go look for a wife. And that again was because Rebekah talked to Isaac and said, see, the kinds of people that Esau is marrying, well, is in the process of marriage. At that time, he had married one already. So, Rebecca said, if Jacob marries from this land like Esau, they will just kill me. So, can we ask Jacob to go to our people and get a correct wife? Uh, Isaac said, Oh, fine. And Isaac called Jacob and blessed Jacob and now sent Jacob away. It was when, I, oh God, forgive Rebecca. It, when Esau, when Esau now saw, today I'm not, I'm not talking about children yet and sibling, whatever, in marriage context. You see what they did to Jacob in that home? When Jacob now, when Esau, I mean, you see what they did to Esau in that home? When Esau now realized that the father had specifically called Jacob, blessed Jacob, and sent Jacob to go get a wife from Padan Aram, instead of marrying from here, it was as if this was the first time that it was dawning on Esau that his parents were not completely comfortable with the choice of marriage that he had made. So he now decided to find another one, another wife. He went to marry another wife uh, that he now felt at least this one will please my parents a bit. <laughs> Are you with me? I, I don't even want to go into the psychological torture that Isaac went, that Esau went through at the hands of his own parents. in his own house, and he was first born. He just says that, oh, so it's like, they don't like, oh, what do I do to make them like? He became a polygamist to please his parents. Jacob, obviously, was now the preferred one. So what did I do now? So this is how Jacob left home. Jacob now left home with the blessings of his father. That was the real blessing. The one you stole is not your own. No. The, that time that he came and he said, ah, the voice is a voice of Esau, but the hand is a hand of, the voice is a voice of Jacob. The hand is a hand of Esau. That was not the blessing. No, that couldn't have been. That was not the blessing. Read your Bible very well. Eventually, Isaac called Jacob and properly blessed Jacob as Jacob and sent him away from home. That was the blessing with which Jacob left home. It was the blessing of the Lord. And the blessing of the Lord, it make it rich and acts with it no sorrow. It was the reason why you could not successfully cheat Jacob. You know, he left him with a staff, one rod in his hand, and the shepherd's bag. When he was coming back, it was a great company. He left home with intangible materials. 
The blessing is not, first and foremost, a tangible thing. The blessing of God is not riches. You can see a rich man that is broke, that is poor. You will see a, rich, you, a blessed man that is broke, that is poor. You can see a blessed man that is in jail. Like Joseph. Huh? Yes. Joseph was blessed. He was a slave. From slavery became a prisoner slave. Where well, was blessed? It's just that if the blessing is there, it will make rich. And when it starts to bring the riches, it will not add sorrow to it. A lot of people, it is when they see the riches that they identify the blessing. But you should not be that ignorant. Oh, believer. Riches are not the blessings. They are the consequences of the blessing. It is a blessing of the Lord that makes rich. Huh? And will add no sorrow to it. So there was really nothing you could have done to Jacob. He told Laban, you see, you changed my wages ten times. Like you negotiated my salary ten times. Yet, as it stands today, I'm wealthier than you are. And he said, if it was not that the God of my father Isaac and the fear of Abraham were with, was with me, now you would have sent me away empty-handed. I'm trying to say to you that the man left him with a blessing. And that blessing was given to him intentionally, deliberately, consciously by his father, knowing full well that this is Jacob, my, my second son. Are you with me? So what was the point of all the scheming that Rebecca schemed? And I was telling you this to say to you that I am convinced that if Rebecca had come home from inquiring of the Lord to tell her husband, like, look at what the Lord has said concerning the destinies of the children that are in my womb, beginning from saying that there are two sons in my womb. That's what God said. Those days, there were no scan, there were... So, by the time she goes into labor and gives birth, if actually two children came out, it would be obvious that, ah, this woman had God. Are you with me? If this one has been immediately verified, then every other thing she said obviously would be so. So, they would have groomed the children and brought everybody into their ordination as said by the Lord. It won't be a one aside. Where... Rebecca is alone behind the scenes trying to realize and enforce and actualize the will of God over her son who belongs also to her husband. And then the husband is innocently but ignorantly going ahead to do what any normal father will do given the circumstance. You give the blessing of the firstborn to the firstborn. Unless the Lord had spoken otherwise. Since the man is not aware that the Lord had spoken otherwise, he wanted to do the normal thing. Are you with me? Remember that. That day that Jacob, the beloved son of Rebekah, left home, that was the last day Rebekah saw Jacob on this side of eternity. When Jacob came back from his sojourn, 20 something years later, the father who was saying, I may soon die, so let me bless you before I die. And Rebecca, that was alive and active, it was the father that was still alive. The mother, Rebecca, had died. So, all of that love, all of that protection, all of because when Jacob was leaving home, Rebecca didn't know it was going to take 20 something years. What did Rebecca say? He said, go to my people, all right, and get a wife. So until the anger of your brother Esau is calmed down, then I will send for you to come back home. That day never broke until Rebecca died. So 
all of the blessings that manifested in the life of Jacob and everything God did in his life and by his life, his affluence, his wealth, his prosperity, his extension and all of that, Rebekah did not see it. When they came back, when God said, go back to Bethel in Genesis 35, and they went back there and pitched their tent and built an altar. After a while, he said, you see where my father is there now? It's not far. Let me go there and see how they fare. It was on the way to go to see the father Isaac. That was when Rachel went into labor and gave birth to uh, Benjamin and died in the process. But then, of course, they continued their journey. So Rachel was buried in the way on, on your way to Bethlehem, right? That was the journey to return to see his dad. By the time he got home to see his dad, his mom was dead. The last time his mom saw him, he was single. Huh? He was single and running for dear life because his brother Esau was so angry and was hoping to kill him. Everybody thought Isaac was on his way to the grave. In fact, Esau said, I will wait until the days of the morning for my father are over. Then I'll kill Jacob. Even Esau thought that the dad will soon die. The dad thought he may soon die. The person that nobody was thinking death around was the schema in chief. That's Rebecca. She was the first person that died. But the point of that story is to say to you that Rebecca and Isaac's wedding or marriage is after Adam and Eve. This is the next prototype that you have in scripture that provides one of the clearest examples of a marriage that was made in heaven. Of a match, at least, that was made in heaven. The home was chaotic and scattered and divided Yet, you couldn't say, maybe Isaac married wrongly. So my thesis is, the will of God is necessary, but it is not sufficient. Can we agree on that now? Yes, sir. Can we agree on that? Yes, so necessary means you have to have the will of God. Not sufficient means that you don't go to sleep. To say, after I married God's will, so he has to. No. Marrying God's will means that it will work, it can work out well, it should work out well. But it is not sufficient on its own. And at least I've given you, I've given you two instances from scripture. Hallelujah. So nothing that I've said in the last two, nothing that I've said in the last two uh, episodes is supposed to indicate or to suggest that God's will is not necessary or important so long as you do the things you need to do in order to achieve oneness of mind, oneness of purpose, oneness of this, oneness of that. I haven't been dealing with the will of God. I've been taking for granted that if you are a believer, you will marry according to God's will. I'm simply saying to you that when you do get married, oneness has different aspects to it and the way that each of those aspects is achieved is not the same are you with me i'm not saying that if you can pursue oneness you don't need to bother about god's will no god's will is necessary but it is not sufficient so these other things we are saying are the things that bring in that element of sufficiency into the marriage to say now that Point one, the will of God. Then, because that's necessary, but it's not sufficient. What are the other building blocks? Is that okay? So if you were laboring under that misconception, I hope we got that out of the way. Hallelujah. So last Tuesday, we looked at Michal uh, quite 
extensively, if I remember. We look at Michal, and we said that as beautiful as their love story was from the beginning, we realized that a point came when there was this divergence. And that divergence was on account of the fact that Saul was hunting for David. As David escaped, he escaped without his wife, Michal. When David escaped without his wife, eventually they gave Michal to another man. And David now became a fugitive for maybe some 10 plus years, over 10 years, of Michal living with another man. When David eventually was delivered from all of his adversity and affliction, he is now back. He becomes king. Eventually, Michal is brought back to him. He made that one of the criteria for brokering peace with Abner. We looked at that last Tuesday. So Michal is brought back home to him. But now, the David and the Michal that were maybe lovebirds some 13 years ago when they, got, when they first got married have literally become two very different people. The rainmaker still made rain. <laughs> we will still close early. I have, um, I have a Twitter spaces for 8.30. Uh, I want to discuss Peter Obi, and I want to discuss Bart. I met Bola, I met Tinubu, and the Muslim, Muslim ticket. Hmm? It's going to be one of a couple of Twitter spaces that I will host. And then eventually I intend to host Peter Obi himself. Um, yes. That's, that's not to say that I am obedient. It's just to say that I will host Peter Obi. Amen. Amen. Uh, the reasons are very obvious. A lot of people around me uh, are obedient in the P2B sense. And I think it's only important to interrogate him in my space. To say, what, 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 what's, what is this about? All right? Meanwhile, I'm open to interrogating Bart at night. And um, okay, what's the, all right? I'm, so I'm open to interrogating, to interviewing Bart at night and at Tiku in the afternoon. <laughs> so if you can make it happen, make it happen. I don't want to be. It's not going to be one-sided. I will not pretend. Whether you like it or not, we are all political, right? I'm political, even as a man of God, I'm political. What I don't want to appear to be as a man of God is partisan. I'm not partisan, but I'm political. You cannot afford to be political, to not be political, I mean to say. Is that okay? Politics is simply the art and science and engagement of resource control. That's what or allocation, resource allocation. That's what politics is about. It's simply about who gets what. That's what politics is about. And there's nobody here that is not in, impacted, influenced, or affected in one way or the other by those decisions. It affects you in one way or the other. So every one of us here is political. You can choose to not be partisan. So I do not hold the card of a political party. Is that okay? Because I'm not partisan in that sense. But that doesn't mean I'm not political. I can, even if I don't want to, it's inevitable. The same for all of you watching me online, even if you are from North Korea. You are political. Whether you're, the system of government under which you live is a militocracy, you are political. So we're not going to pretend about it. Is that okay? So I have. Um, Twitter spaces uh, that I'll be hosting this evening, hoping that um, all goes well. So, rain or no rain, we'll end this on time. Having said that also, um, there are some very important, some two, three important announcements that I need to make at the end of my teaching this evening. So, those of you following us online, 
until you have heard those announcements, don't go anywhere. Because the service is not over until I've made those announcements. Hallelujah. Alright, and then a uh, pre-announcement. Um, whether you are online or you are on site, officially we don't take offerings on Tuesday, but you are very welcome to give. A lot of people have Ask me questions and all of that. I don't have any position on Tuesday evening offerings. I have no position. You can give as unto the Lord. The Lord will receive it from you. We are just not asking you to give. Is that okay? So ushers, make sure that uh, there is a, a drum <laughs> somewhere for people to pour in their offerings. Those that are on site. So that nobody will say we are preventing them from being blessed. We don't officially take offering on Tuesday evening, but a lot of people have been asking me. So online, on site, if you do want to, please, you are very welcome to. But feel no obligations. Amen. So three announcements uh, when I'm done teaching. Stay with me. So when Mikal, I wish, yeah, we can work with Mikal. I could show you a few other instances of those things in the Old Testament. But the point was to say that whatever the purpose of God for David and Michal was supposed to be, all right, there was a separation that happened for about 10 plus years, I imagine. And by the time they came back together, it looked like they were two very different persons now. David is going to bring back the ark of the Lord into the city. And Michal is very nonchalant and is uninvolved. Absolutely uninvolved. Michal eventually gets to the point where she looks at David through the window as David is dancing before the Lord, before the ark of the Lord as it's brought back into Jerusalem. And Michal despised David in her heart. She didn't stop with despising David in her heart. She proceeded to give expression to the very inappropriate thoughts that had run through her heart. That was the kind of, this was this, this, that's the kind of thing that was now happening with Michal. But when you look at the earlier story of Michal and David from uh, when they first got married in 1 Samuel chapter 19, you would not have imagined that they will be these polar somewhere down the line all right and we said and we did say that they did not just grow apart they grew apart and they grew differently all right you see one person can be in lagos another person is in london so they are apart and they could be growing but two people can be in the same room and they can still grow apart there's a growing apart that is a growing in different direction. There's a growing apart that is growing in two different places. Now, that growing apart that is growing in different direction is what I'm referring to as growing differently. They didn't just grow apart, they grew differently. David is growing to become one kind of thing. Michal is growing to become another kind of thing. So that by the time they came together, it looked as if there was no possibility of a synergy or of a yoking or of a, not even measure, of a unity, of harmony in that, uh, in that marriage context. So, what I want to do this evening is to, you know, try to ask a few practical questions. And, of course, we still do that biblically. Song of Solomon, chapter 4. I hope it gets us there. Song of Solomon, chapter 4. So, Song of Solomon is a very beautiful, um, has been my longest best book of the Bible. You know, you have different best book of the Bible. All right. Yes, Song of Solomon has been the longest, best book of the Bible that I've had. Still very, very, very up there on the list. Um, it never fails. Every time I call it, it answers. When I knock, it opens. Amen. 
chapter 4 from verse 12. A garden encloses my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain seal, thy plants, an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, campfire with spikenard, spikenard with saffron, calamus, and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, mar and aloes, with all the chief spices. I, I, have we looked at this passage before, male and female? Yes, I think we have, right? Yes, yeah, but I, I can't even remember what we we're looking at then. Anyway, my focus this evening is co heirs of a common destiny or not. So that's what I'm running after. Verse 15, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and streams from Lebanon. Everything you've read from verse 12 to verse 15 is from the guy. That is a man talking about, that's a male uh, bringing descriptions about the female. So that's a guy talking about the lady that is supposed to be his wife or his wife-to-be. They are in love, all right? Verse 16 is the lady now speaking. So 12 to 15 is a guy describing the lady. A lot of metaphoric, flowery languages there. Verse 16 is the lady now responding. And the lady says, Awake, O north wind, and come thou south. Blow upon my garden that the spices thereof may flow out. What this lady is saying is, yes, I am a garden that is enclosed. Remember that in verse 12? Um, I'm a spring that is shut up. I'm a fountain that is sealed. That means, that means I am beautiful. I am uh, uh, I'm wonderful. Uh, I am lush and all of that. But I am covered. Garden but enclosed. That means it's a garden, but it is fenced. It's protected. It's guarded. It's fenced. It is, I'm a spring, but this spring is shut up. It's shut. I am a fountain, but this fountain is sealed. So if you walked by, you will not know that this is a garden that contains all these wonderful trees and herbs and spices because it is a garden but it is enclosed enclosed you will not know that i have capacity to give life saving refreshing because even though i am a if a, a, a spring this spring is what it is shut up and i'm a fountain yes but this fountain is sealed so it's like a well. If you live in northern Nigeria, you know wells. We have wells. A lot of compounds have wells that you draw water from. Except that this time around, this well is not the sort that you draw water from. It is the one that the water actually is supposed to, to spring up, to well out by itself. So it, 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 it's, it's like a fountain. That's till today we say our fountains, right? Fountains that are artificially constructed. And it is the ability to push out water upwards. But this fountain now is sealed. So you still will not feel the impact externally. These are the metaphors with which the man describes the woman. Now the woman is saying, I agree that I am all of these things you have said. So what does the woman say? The woman now said in verse 16, Awake, O north wind, and come thou south. So that's both the north wind and the south wind. Come. Do what? Blow upon my garden. It's not to blow my garden up. It's to blow upon my garden. It's not to remove the enclosure. Remember, it's a garden enclosed. Right? It's not to remove the enclosure. It is to blow upon the garden that the spices thereof may flow out the aroma of the garden. Let the wind come so that the wind can activate the aroma to flow out of the garden. And this aroma will now be the guide for my beloved to come into the garden. 
that the man who is supposed to marry me, the man who is supposed to be my husband, the man that is supposed to come into this garden, is supposed to come because the wind blows upon my garden, this garden, and then when the wind blows upon it, the wind will now take news or aroma or the, 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 the odor or the subsisting plants and spices and trees that are in this garden and then the wind will blow it out when this goes out the person that is supposed to be my husband will now perceive and say mm, mm, where is this odor coming from and he will now use the odor to trace the garden so that in zion if you have it, you don't flaunt it. Out there in the world, you flaunt it if you have it. In Zion, you can be all of that garden, but you are supposed to be enclosed. A garden enclosed. So, how will people know? who We have an advertising agency. His name is the North Wind. The Holy Spirit. Is the one that is responsible for advertising daughters of Zion. That that thing that God has done in your life, the Holy Spirit is the one that bears witness. He's the spirit of witness. He's the one that leads the man and guides the man. And the man will arrive there. It's not because the garden became exposed. And the man says, hey, I like what I see. No, 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 no. Huh? It is... I like what I sense. Huh? It is, it is, it is, uh, this is why it does not matter whether the other person is in Tokyo and the other person is in Okitikupa. There is a wind. There's a wind. And I want you to know that if it is your garden, this wind knows where you are at. It will take, it will blow upon that garden and then the spices will go out and locate you. You will use the aroma. It will be like the guiding star of the wise men that were looking for Jesus. The aroma will guide you until you arrive at the garden. So, it is a good prayer to pray. That you probably want to take away home to pray. Whether you are a man or woman. Because if you are a man, there is a garden somewhere. If you are a woman, in context, you are a garden. And you may need the services of the wind. Man and woman. You, the man needs the services of the wind. The woman needs the services of the wind. Because the wind needs to blow upon the garden to take out the aroma. So that the man can be intimated. To, ah, 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 ah. And then the man can trail it and trace it. And arrive at the garden. So that this garden can be advertised without being exposed. It will not be because you, you flaunted it. Huh? It will be because the wind advertised you. So you will notice that there might be a sister that is just like a sister to you. <laughs> now, so there might be Glory to God. So, there might be a sister. Why are people laughing now? <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. So, there might be a sister that is just like a sister to you. And it has been so for the past three years. You people knew each other shortly before COVID. And you know, we even used to come and do fasting camp here together. She was just like a sister. To you then suddenly it's as if suddenly suddenly let me hear you say suddenly, suddenly. uh-huh suddenly suddenly the wind boom and then you enter that situation now where you cannot say i sleep but my heart wicked even when you are sleeping your heart is awake because the wind has done its job. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. 
Thank you, Holy Spirit. You see, this wind knows your address. Huh? The wind knows your address. The sister may not know where you live, but the wind knows where you live. You may not know where the sister lives, but the wind know, knows where she is. The wind is an, is an infinite, eh? infallible connector. Hallelujah. You see, so, some of you, hmm, including the admission you were looking for in ABU Zaria that you did not get. It was because the wind was trying to position you. Because there are more important things in life than the university from which you graduated. Hallelujah. Let me hear you say the wind. Now, that's by the way. It's just prayer point for somebody. The lady says, Awake, O north wind, and come thou south. Blow upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. What will be the result? Let my beloved come into what? So we begin, we begin by looking at, we are looking at co heirs of a common destiny or not. So hear this. The lady said, Awake, O north wind, and come thou south, blow upon what? My garden. Let me hear you say, My garden. My garden. When the lady is praying, the lady first says, This is my garden. What the lady calls my garden is her life. It's her life that she's calling my garden. But before she is done finished praying, she, before she's done praying, she says, Let my beloved come into his garden. Is my garden different from what she's calling his garden? No. It is my garden. But let my beloved come into his garden. Excuse me. By the time the beloved is coming, how does it become his garden? Was he the one that planted it? Was it the one that has been taking care of it? These 22 years, suddenly, they are now saying, his garden. And it's not just they, it's a lady herself who first said, my garden, that is now saying, his garden. By the time the wind has come into this matter, we will need to adjust our grammar. Hello? Yes, it is exclusively my garden until you called the wind. Say, this is how I am. This is, here. This is me. We are aware. If you want it to remain so, don't bother the wind. If the wind is to do the wind's work, the garden will have to adopt an additional ID. An additional identity that is what his garden it is not let my beloved come into my garden it is let my beloved come into his garden <laughs> we are just beginning and eat what his pleasant fruits not the pleasant fruit not my pleasant fruit but his pleasant fruit remember that it is my garden. Even the guy, the, the brother, admits it in verse 12. A garden enclosed is my sister. A spring shut up. A fountain sealed. And then in verse 13, he says, Thy orchard, thy orchard. All right? Thy plant, sorry. Thy plants are an orchard. It's your plant. Your plant, they are an orchard. And all of that. Yet, the lady now says, Let awake, O north wind, and come thou south, blow upon my garden, let the, uh, that the spices thereof may flow out, let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. So, my garden, let him come into my garden. No. Let him come into his garden. 
Let him eat my pleasant fruit. No, let him eat his pleasant fruit. It means that when this guy comes into the garden that is now called his garden, he will not just eat all the fruits that are in the garden. Which one will he eat? His pleasant fruit. His pleasant fruit. Hallelujah. We are coming back. Now look at chapter 2. Verse 2. In chapter 2 verse 2 of Song of Solomon. As the lily among thorns. So is my love among the daughters. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood. So is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow. With what? great delight and his fruit his fruit was sweet to my taste next verse he brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was love so uh, steam me with flagons comfort me with apples for I am sick of love now my, my emphasis here is that the lady speaks in the third verse and says, As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight. With great delight. And his fruit was sweet to my taste. You are not ready for this one this evening. The way I'm looking at your face. Huh? I'm not, I have not sufficiently primed you up for this thing. So, I'm trying to say to you, however, that the approach of the man to the fruit of the lady is different from the approach of the lady to the fruit of the man. He that has ears, let him hear what the scripture says to the church. And she that has ears, let her hear what Gideon explains from that scripture. Glory to God. You step down into darkness, open my eyes, let me see beauty that may this heart adore you, hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say, You're my God. You're together, Lord. All together, worthy. Wonderful to me. So the way that the man responds to he to her fruit is different from the way that the lady responds to his fruit. Can you do you already get the point I was trying to make? That I say we're not ready for it. Hello? Can you see the point? Can you see the point? You can see the point. The point is, without telling you, without explaining, the point is this. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. His fruit was sweet 
to my taste. His fruit, sweet to my taste. Hmm? Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant his pleasant his what? His pleasant fruit. She did not say, let my beloved come into his garden and eat his fruit. It is his pleasant fruit. So the ones that are unpleasant, what will happen to those ones? They will be ignored. They will not be eaten. When the lady came to the man, I sat down under his shadow with great delight and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He that has ears, <laughs> let him hear. You cannot get more out of me tonight on this matter. Now, so when, 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 when she says, let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruit, that's the lady. What did the beloved say? Verse, the next verse. The next verse is what? Chapter 5, verse 1. That's the next verse. We're the ones that put the chapter and verses. This is the continuation of the gist. Look at the response of the, of the guy. What did the guy say? He said, I am come into my garden. Hmm. You know, you are just like a sister to me. I am come into my garden, my sister, my spouse. But hear this. The lady said, let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruit. The guy said, I am come into my garden. Remember, the lady was the one that said, let my beloved come into his garden. Hmm? It was important to hear from the guy. When we heard from the guy, the guy said, yes, it is my garden. Because sometimes sisters are donating gardens to brothers who are not aware of the gardens that is being donated. <laughs> you were the one that called it his garden. What is his own position on the matter? When you said, this my garden is now his garden, what did he say? Because even that your spiritual friend Amos, Amos said that can two walk together unless they agree. Uh, you know, uh -huh. you know, you used to talk with Amos in the vision and in trances. Amos, Amos, Amos said that two people cannot walk together unless they agree. So it's important that the brother brings the completing side of that statement. When the lady called it his garden, it was important that the brother also comes up and says, my garden. That's the point at which the brother is owning it. The brother is accepting, taking responsibility. The brother is confirming the conviction of the sister. Remember that the sister did not call the brother. The sister called the wind. Hmm? Yes, the wind was supposed to be the one to call the brother. That's, you know, so that way you can keep your dignity intact. The brother will just suddenly appear and say, hey, what, what's the matter here? What's going on? And I say, well, sister, I don't... You will not see before me like he took you on our ways, like you don't want. 
Meanwhile, you were the one that had been begging wind for eight months now. Eight months, you've been begging wind <laughs> to blow. <laughs> now that the wind has blown and has brought the brother, you are now saying, okay, uh, I need to take some time. <laughs> I need to take some time to pray. As if you have not been on the matter. <laughs> oh, sisters. Twelve. <laughs> But you see, there, there, there is so much beauty and dignity in that. Not, I'm, I don't mean in the game. I mean in the procession, in the progression, right? The lady beckons on the wind to blow upon the garden so that the wind blowing upon the garden will be the one to make announcement to the brother and then the brother can come without the lady making advances to the guy. Just... Just make sure you are loaded. Let there be something that wind can use to advertise. That's, that's the matter. That's the matter. Hmm? So, that, so that wind will not just blow wind. <laughs> you not be, wind will say, I'm trying my best. I'm... <laughs> Let, let there be something that wind can carry when it blows. Hmm? Mm -hmm. you, you know, we've not really done Song of Solomon. Hmm. We, we, we need, I don't know, maybe some 15, 20 episodes to do the book of Song of Solomon. Huh? That's the public version. When you now join the couples club, or now do the married version. See, this thing is, this one is, is deep in an accessible way. You know, there's deep that you can't get. This one is very deep, but it's beautifully deep. We, you, we, we need to, there are three categories of items in the garden. Are you with me? They are fruit bearing. Let's leave that. But I wanted to tell you that there are spices in the garden for a reason. Spice. Like frank incense. Incense that is frank. <laughs> Not false incense, frank. Frank incense. Aloes. Ma. Those incense are there for a reason. Is that's the easiest thing for the wind to carry. Yet when the beloved comes, it is fruit that he will eat. That's why those combinations are important. Bro is not going to eat incense. He's not uh... <laughs> I saw, I saw, I, I am sure it was intentionally designed. I, I saw one perfume on Twitter. You know this yield? Huh? Those youth classes. This one they said youth day mad. <laughs> you day mad. <laughs> we don't eat youth day anything. Hmm? The one that used to rain in our days, like I said to you, is Malaysia. They don't used to eat Malaysia. Hello? Okay, what I'm saying is that no brother will eat room freshener. Say, ah, your apartment smells nice. Uh -huh. After that, there has to be something that we can swallow. <laughs> so the wind, the wind, 
the wind will blow. <laughs> okay. Just make sure there's something for the wind to blow. Is that okay? Yes. Now, the, my point is, co heirs of a common destiny or not. Isn't it? Yes. So let's stay on track. There are too many different things here. So that verse 1 says, I am come into my garden. My sister, my spouse. So first thing is, the brother calls it my garden. Just as the sister said, his garden. So we see agreement there. My sister, my spouse. I have gathered my ma with my what? Spice. I've gathered those ones. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. Excuse me. Do you see the kind of personal language this guy is using here? I have gathered my. Ma with my spouse. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Then, they, they are committee of friends. Hmm? The committee of friends, they are friends. Now said, eat, oh friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, oh beloved. That's the end of that drama. So chapter 5 actually should have started from what you have as verse 2. Is that okay? Yes, uh -huh. Because it was people that just did this chapterization. That's the end of the thought that we followed from verse, um, verse 12. So what you see going on here is, and I wish, I don't have a lot of time, but I need to do this because it's a very important part of the point we're trying to make. When the brother comes into the garden, and in context, when the brother came into the garden, what happened? The brother said, I have gathered my ma with my spouse. Did we see ma and spices in verse 13 and verse 14? Yes, we saw ma, we saw spices there. He said, I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. Did we see honey in verse 12, 13, 14? No, we did not see honey there. So somehow, this guy loves honey. But when he came, before he came, there was no honey. But now that he has arrived, somehow he's eating honey. And he's eating the honey from the same garden that did not have honey before he came. Well, you know, the lady was the one that said, let him come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruit. Yeah. So, anything that is in the garden that is pleasant to the brother, brother will eat. Anything that is pleasant to the brother, but absent from the garden, either brother will abstain or brother will plant. Are you with me? Yes. yes. It is either, ah, I like, I like honey. Oh. And I don't even have time to go into the honey business. Do you know how you get honey? You know that honey is not the sap of the fig tree. You know that that's how you get honey. <laughs> honey. Honey does not come from the oak tree. It's not, it doesn't flow out of the cedar of Lebanon. It is bees that produce honey. And apart from producing honey, bees also do all that. They have other expertise. What do they do? They stink. Oh, you are the, it's not deep. It's the one you know I'm talking about. Like bees, they stink. Because when I say, what do they do? You are trying to think of something deep. No. Bees stink. You, you cannot... You cannot love honey behind bees. If you love honey, you will need to deal with bees. That's how it happens. In, on the way to having that honey, honey. Mm. <laughs> it is bees <laughs> that produce honey. So if you don't know how to handle the bees, hmm? 
you will you you will be a swollen honey eater like Say, say, see, that my wife, but when she wants to be good, she's really, she's a, she's a very nice person, no? but when her madness comes, you see this mark here? <laughs> because there's a way to handle bees, to get honey without swelling up, without, without bee stings. Are you with me? So, since the brother insists on honey, they will need to introduce bees into the garden. Because this brother now, as you know, this is the garden that is his garden. There is no other garden that is his garden. And Proverb already told us that it is this fountain alone that must satisfy you. This is the only place that you must drink from. It is the wife of your youth. You can't, you can't look for honey elsewhere. So if it is not present, it's either you curtail your appetite. Say, ah, where I come from, eh? This dog we used to use for a Sunday celebration every Sunday. Hmm? Dog meat. Meanwhile, this sister does not, uh, does not know how to pound dogs. Do you know how they kill dogs? Let's not go there. My point is, anything that is not present, if it is pleasant, and not present. You have two choices. As a brother, what do you do? You either forfeit it or you plant it. So you will plant it and groom it and groom it and groom it. So honey was not in the garden in verses 13, 14. Now we see honey in the garden. Hmm. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Do you know how you get wine? Yes, there are traces, there are evidences that the raw material for producing wine may have been in the garden. But wine is also not naturally occurring. Are you with me? How do you get milk? You know that milk is also not the sap of Dogon Yaro. <laughs> milk. <laughs> milk comes from animal husbandry. You, you are going to if you insist on milk, you don't want to do soya beans. <laughs> it's milk. Milk, milk. What you are seeing here now, this is the point. What you're seeing here now is that by the time the man and the woman have come together, there is a lot of addition and, subtract and subtractions that are going on here. Huh? In order to arrive at the final state of the garden that the man and the woman live on. Because you see, you may think that we are still talking about the woman, the woman. No, we are no longer just talking about the woman. Because at this point, the man has adopted the same language of the first part of the 16th verse of the fourth chapter. Awake, O north wind. Blow, uh, come thou south. Blow upon my garden. What was she calling my garden? Her life. Now, the man is now saying, I am come into my garden. Do you get my point? So, when the man is now saying, I'm coming to my garden. Meanwhile, the lady said, blow upon my garden. And it looks as if they are talking about the same thing. I'm saying to you that at this point, it is no longer the man talking about the woman. We are no longer just discussing the life of the woman. We are now discussing their lives together, all right, as a couple. So that the outcome of the man and the woman coming together, we are talking about co heirs of a common destiny or not. 
So do you see what, what we have been doing very lightheartedly? This, this is the point. So you have now a common patrimony, common destiny, common lot. That common lot is a, con a, co a, a, a coalition, is a collocation, is a coming together of something that was there before the brother came and something that was not there until the brother came. There will be elimination reactions that will take place. You will notice now that the things that were patronized by the brother, some of them were not there. And there were things that used to be there that are now de-emphasized and ignored because they are not pleasant to the brother. They, don't, they didn't make the list of his pleasant fruits. And I'm now out of time. So that story of, um, of Isaac and of Rebecca that I wanted to, that I said we we're going to reference, it is a fact that at the core of their DNA, and you will see that also in this story, at the core of their DNA, the prophetic words that went ahead of Isaac when the Lord was speaking to Abraham after Abraham had agreed to offer his son Isaac in Genesis 22, okay, were the same as the prophetic words that were used for the sent forth service of Rebekah when Rebekah was living home in Genesis chapter 24. Hmm? Genesis 22. I, I will be done with this in two minutes. Genesis 22, verse 15. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, says the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless you, and in multiplying I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of his enemy. And in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because thou hast obeyed my voice. So remember that they said to him that your seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Who was that seed? Isaac. Isn't it? Genesis 24. From verse 57. After uh, the servant of, Isaac, of Abraham had met the parents of Rebekah and they agreed for, to the marriage, the, lady said, the guy said, please, let me go. And they said, no, let the lady spend some time with us. That's Rebecca. Let her stay with us, even if it's for 10 days. And, she said, and he said, no, please, let me go. God has already showed me favor. Don't delay me. So they said, well, we call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. Genesis 24, 57. And then in verse 58, and they called Rebecca and said unto her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. And they sent away Rebecca, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said unto her, You are our sister. Be thou the mother of thousands of millions. And let your seed possess the gate of those which hate them. This was happening in Rebekah's house in Padan Aram. Far away. Meanwhile, when God was talking to Abraham on account of that thing with Isaac, these were the exact words of commitment that God gave to Abraham concerning his seed. The bearer of the dynasty of Abraham was Isaac. That's the one in whom the seed of Abraham will be named. And that is the seed through whom the seed of Abraham will possess the gate of their enemies. Now, Rebecca, in a faraway country, is being sent away to her husband's house. And the blessing that the siblings of Rebecca pronounced upon her was the same blessing that had been pronounced upon her husband by the Lord, even though these two people did not confer one with another. Co-heirs of a common destiny or not, 
Yes, it is co-heirs of a common destiny. At the core, it may not look like it, but at the core, you would realize that the ordination of God for two people at the core will have a, 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 a unity. Not because you are uniting them, but because they are united in essence. They will be united in essence. There will be a lot of differences in expressions and manifestations. And when I come back in the next part, I will now be picking it up from here. It's been a long journey to this place. But I'm sure you can begin to see the outlines of what I'm trying to do. Because these are very sensitive issues. We need to take the long route to get in there. You know, we can do it in 40 days. We can do it in 40 years. God said, if we do it in 40 days, you will not arrive. You, the kind of war you will see, you become afraid and you will go back. So let's... So you'd have thought that the 40 year journey was, ah, why, why? Hmm. Whatever you thought of it, the shorter route would have led nowhere. So sometimes, uh, the shortest route is not always the best route. And I'm doing this thing so that you can enter into it from a place of revelation that is based on the word of God. You know, there's a way you will know it that you will know it. Even if you cannot logically, biblically, doctrinally defend it, you will still know it. Are you with me? Uh, six years down the line, ten years down the line, it will become impossible for anybody to convince you otherwise because you know it. You may have even forgotten all the passages, but the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. You will know that God didn't bring you here to come and compete with a man or didn't you bring you here to come and compete with a woman. What begins as her garden ends up as my garden. And so there is that very delicate balance between my garden, his garden. He's like, it's the same garden, but it's my garden. It's the same garden, but it's also like his garden. And it is instructive that it was the friends that used more of the corporate language than the people involved, involved in the marriage. So you, you, you didn't really hear any of them say, our garden. Part of the reason for that is because of responsibility. One of the easiest way to abdicate your responsibility is to, is to pluralize the responsibility. Hmm? We are responsible. Usually nobody takes the responsibility. I am responsible is more helpful most of the time. Huh? Or you are responsible. We are very clear. I am responsible. We are very clear. So it is her garden. Her plants are an orchard. My garden. His garden. My garden. The first my garden was a lady. After that, she said his garden. Then the next my garden was a guy. And they were all talking about the same objective thing. That same thing. That the brother began by calling it totally her thing. The sister eventually said, it is my thing, but it is your thing. And the brother now came and owned it with his full chest. And said, yes, I have come into my garden. So you now go from this, her garden, to her saying, my garden, and then say, his garden, and then him now say, my garden. And all of those things are held in a delicate tension as you go through the practice of marriage life, of married life. So, there will be a fusion, the practicalities and the outworkings and, you know, the tangibilities of, those, of that fusion will be what I will deal with the next time. But at least the framework, you understand it. Do you understand the framework now? Do you understand the framework? So we can now say, oh, so it doesn't mean that a lady is you know, thing before she got married is completely obliterated because she got married. Yes. And it also doesn't mean that where well, the lady will carry her own, the brother will carry their own, her, his own, anywhere that something agrees, they will do it together. It also doesn't mean so. Are you with me? 
Are you with me? There is a sense in which there is a forging that takes place so that one thing emerges in the end. That one thing that emerges is our thing, but there is a sense in which, you know, it's, it's my thing. And there's a sense in which it is your thing. But everybody can say that it is our thing. Because that's what you see there. Eat, oh friends, and drink. Yea, drink abundantly, oh beloved. Hallelujah. So I'm going to keep it there um, uh, for the evening. We have taken quite a bit of time beyond what I had expected. So before we pray, before we pray, um, a few very important announcements. We have um, we have fully resumed work on site. The the architect in charge was able to come into town. I think last week Thursday, uh, we needed the supervising architect to um, come into town and to approve a couple of things before we move work to the next stage. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to come to you again with uh, some reports and updates from site. Uh, it's been a while, and uh, we're happy to bring you this quick update. And so, as you can see, a lot of the boarding for the slab on this floor is being done already. And then, once the boarding is done, is finished, we are going to put the uh, the iron rods are going to come on top of this before we do the casting, concrete casting, and then we'll continue to build up what. So we 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 are going to have we are going to spend about thirty six thousand dollars for this casting to have the slab that we're going to raise the admin block on it and the slab that will serve as the gallery in the main auditorium. So the idea and that is because we're even saving cost. So the idea is we'll finish the one for the admin area so we can take all of that woodwork and move it to the uh, entrance area to cast the slab for the gallery. Um, that's going to save us about two million naira um, if we are not just using this wood there. The wood we need to do the, the one for the entrance independently, that woodwork will cost about two million naira. 
Uh, so we want to crave your indulgence. We create um, an exclusive partners uh, platform on WhatsApp so that we can give you regular updates because we believe that we owe you that much. Uh, we don't bug anybody. We don't send reminders for partnership, remittances, and any of that. You made a commitment. You made it to Jesus, and we believe that um, uh, you live up to it. But we owe you updates so that you can see and know what is going on with the monies that you are entrusting to us as our partners. So we're going to do that. Um, the second announcement is... Um, there is a lot that is going to be happening uh, beginning towards the end of this month all the way to the month of November. And in pursuit of that, we are setting up a platform. I mentioned this a few times, but our online, online, our online community, um, we want to have a platform that is dedicated to our online family that are from outside of Nigeria but are elsewhere in Africa. Our online community members who do not live in Africa, whether you're African or you are not African, if you don't live in Africa, uh, we have a platform for our online family members that are not on the African continent. So those two online platforms, the what is it called? The links to joining those platforms would be made available, right? And then um, there'll be. Um, the one for Africa has AF in front of it. Um, the other one has INTC, all right, in the front of it. So the one that has AF in front of it is for Africa. Now, that's very easy to do, right? Uh, if you are Nigerian, you, you shouldn't join any of the group, even if you see the link, because if you join with a Nigerian number, it means you are Nigerian in Nigeria. Uh, if you are not on the African continent, join the one for those not on the continent. If you are on the continent, join the one for those on the continent. It's just simply for, to help with the kinds of things that we want to do. Now, uh, that's because I said, beginning from the end of this month till about November, we're entering a season that I uh, have talked about in the last two years. God spoke to us about that season two years ago, November, in the city of Abuja. So it's towards that kind of end. Now, I also need to say that if you are um, if you are in Nigeria and you are not on any of our platforms, that should be very easy to do. We do have a platform. I'm told that WhatsApp now takes more than 156 people or 256 people. It takes up to 500 or so. Now, all right. So it means that if you are in Nigeria, you are not in JAWS, you know, you can join our platform. So both on WhatsApp and on Telegram. We have a platform on Telegram because Telegram takes more people. We had exhausted the number of spaces we have on, um, on WhatsApp until this upgrade in WhatsApp uh, membership number. There was a group that I was supposed to uh, be with that is supposed to be a ministerial training group. So... I've been able to free my hands a bit. The group has already been created. I'm just not notifying you that I'm going to come around to giving you attention uh, after this weekend. Um, towards the end of this month, I'm also going to put up a little bit of a package uh, to celebrate my birthday because I don't do money giveaways for birthdays. But I think that I should do some kind of giveaway. So there's a course that I've been meaning to host that people are supposed to pay for. I've not been able to put it together yet. It is a course on how to study the Bible, uh, hermeneutics, biblical theology, and systematic theology. So um, because I've not been able to put together the paid course, I'm going to run something along that line as part of my giveaway for my birthday celebration towards the end of the month. Uh, you are going to have to follow the classes live because 
after the classes, I'm going to shut them down. They will not be accessible past the time that they are broadcast because it's going to form part of the paid content. I'm just giving you an opportunity. It's my giveaway. <laughs> all right. So when those, I'm making all those announcements so that um, when you see them, you will know that that's what's going on. Finally, last Tuesday, I talked about they need to start um, something like a skit making group. Um, I've been working a little bit behind the scenes to see how to how best to go about it. Um, the plans have not finally formed, but I think that we are close. So. I'm saying this because the announcements are going to be made in-house. We're only going to announce them here. You're not going to see it anywhere on Facebook or anything of that sort. So if you're not following this, you're not going to hear this. Um, when we make the announcement, the way people can contribute or join in one way or the other, the modalities will also be stated, and you will be told what you can do to be a part of it if you want to be a part of it. I think it's actually going to be called Fontress. Um, I think, yes, I think it's, uh, uh, <laughs> all right, so I think it's going to be a fontress uh, kind of a production thing. So we are working on that. Once the plans mature, we will uh, inform you. Last announcement, since I've used finally, last announcement. <laughs> Those of you that are following uh, uh, from the UK, I'm going to be spending most of August uh, in the UK uh, by the grace of God. I'm going to be spending, I don't know, maybe about three weeks uh, in the month of August in the UK. So I hope that I'll be coming to a city near you. And if you are following notices online, you probably have started seeing some of the flyers. It is legit, by God's grace. We are coming. Hallelujah. In the next 20 seconds, can you say I will not marry wrongly? My marriage will work. I will not marry wrongly. My marriage will work. I will not marry wrongly. When I do get married, and as one who is married, my marriage will work. 10 more seconds. I can't be so instructed, I can't be so informed, I can't be so imparted and marry wrongly. I will not marry wrongly. My marriage will work. My marriage will work. It will be my garden, it will be his garden, it will be my garden, it will be her garden. This thing will work. Yes, it will work. It will work. It will work. It will work. It will work in the name of Jesus. Therefore, I declare that you will not marry wrongly. And I speak life into your marriage. 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 Revival to your marriage. In the name of Jesus. You are blessed forevermore. In Jesus mighty name.